Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. Got a number of fun topics for you in this video. A few that I'm going to be covering include uh, Ripple CTO David Schwartz. He was asked on Quora. He's very active on Quora. I need to start covering more of his stuff on Quora, frankly. But he was asked, one of the questions was uh, about um, how the XRP ledger um, handles two things. Arbitrage and uh, large trade front running, which I'll get into. And uh, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an article from, I think it was Bloomberg. I'll have to pull that up again. I think it was Bloomberg. But uh, CZ, the uh, founder and CEO of Binance, cryptocurrency exchange Binance, uh, he's talking about where he thinks the money that's flowing into crypto is actually coming from, which I found fascinating. And I'm going to touch again on something that I was talking about over the last couple of days, and it has to do with regulatory clarity as it pertains to the cryptocurrency asset class, specifically uh, what's going on over in the UK. And uh, it's being inferred, of course, that uh, it applies to Ripple and, X and what they're doing to build on top of the uh, XRP ledger anyway. So uh, before we get going here, though, if you would, please delicately tap that like button and go ahead and subscribe if you're a fan of Ripple and XRP. First thing I want to cover here, this is a tweet from Nick Bugalis, and I'm still not 100% sure I'm pronouncing that right, so sorry, Nick, if that's incorrect. I haven't heard your name pronounced. Sorry, do my best. But, uh, this, this was from uh, yesterday evening, and he tweeted this out. It was, it was a retweet. Uh, if you have a Wells Fargo account, as in Wells Fargo bank account, ask yourself one simple question. Do you want to continue to allow them to dictate to you what you can and can't do with your money. And so I was like, what's he talking about here? And so I clicked on it, and there's an actual tweet from Wells Fargo here. And check this out. Let me read this, this first, because this is what the Wells Fargo tweet was in response to. There's a guy named Litecoin Moses here. And he tweeted out, <laughs> Something fishy is going on with my bank, Wells Fargo. I can't buy crypto on Cash App or Coinbase. I tried to attach my debit card, and it said, Card not found, and I just use it, used it to pay my bills. And then you've got, uh, this is a verified account, by the way, Ask Wells Fargo here, so this is a legit account, and they responded to that, and they said, thanks for reaching out to us. Unfortunately, Wells Fargo does not allow transactions involving cryptocurrency. That is astonishing. <laughs> I mean, look, we know that there are banks out there like that, but man, they're not even pretend like they're playing ball with their customers. Like, I, It's just, luckily, I've never encountered this with, with my bank. But if somebody's going to tell me what I can and can't do with my money, I mean, as long as it's not something that's illegal, that's offensive. Don't do this. I'm not a baby. I don't need you to hold my hand like this. Uh, it's it's not that much of a big, bad, scary world out there in the crypto space if you're educating yourself. That's just my opinion anyway. So I really don't appreciate this. And so when Nick pointed this out, I was like, oh, my God, are they really doing this? That's such a major corporation. And so um, let's see. Let's go back to Nick's uh, tweet here. I'm wondering. Uh, ah, he got 96 retweets. That's not bad. But uh, anyway, yeah, and uh, I can't remember if I said this when I started reading this tweet. Nick Bugalis, he's a Ripple employee. Um, he's a cryptographer and software engineer, so fascinating anyway. Nonetheless. So I just thought I'd highlight it. Uh, are you guys encountering any of this? Again, I, I'm so lucky. I haven't, thankfully, but I've always had this fear, like, what if it's implemented and then something doesn't go through that I wanted to go through? That could be problematic, and it would really irritate me because I buy on uh, Uphold. I buy all my XRP on, on Uphold. I've just had a fantastic... Uh, experience with them. I've been buying on there for, it's probably a little over a year now, I think, at this point. And uh, I, at times, uh, it's crossed my mind as, as I'm uh, pressing a transaction. You know, it takes five to seven days, whatever it is, for the, the transaction to complete and go through and get the money from my checking account, because I, I did link up my, my personal checking account for this. And if if it were to not go through because of my bank, it makes me wonder. It's like, well, you know, uphold the way it works, even though there's that five to seven day delay in, in from when you order to, to when you get your XRP, uh, they do lock in the rate. So even though the transaction isn't technically quite finalized, they lock in the rate So from, from when you purchase it. It made me think, well, what if I buy it, and then the rate, uh, say the price of XRP goes up, and then my transaction fails? And that had just conceptually crossed my mind. So hopefully I never encounter that, but uh, just uh, one of those things out there. One day we're not going to have to deal with this, though. Once, once uh, cryptocurrency is widely accepted, adopted en masse, this will be a thing of the past. Eventually, uh, a lot of banks are going to be uh, custodians for cryptocurrencies, I believe, and and uh, some traditional banking. Um, I'd say some of the the reason that people go to banks for traditional banking, I think some of that's going to dry up as as time passes. But we can talk about more than that in another video. That's a whole different topic. The next piece here, this is from XRP Symbol, and he, he tweeted out to uh, XRP Tipbot account, which was created by Wheatsay Wind. Um, 
Oh, wait, uh, yeah, there we go, okay. Uh, and he tweeted out, does at XRP tipbot operate in a decentralized manner without central servers uh, crawling tweets? And we'd say when the creator of it uh, responded, the tipbot is not decentralized and why should it be? And uh, there's really no no need for it, you know, and it's it's um, it's it's funny to me, like as great as blockchain technology is for certain applications, Brad Garlinghouse, Ripple CEO, has frequently made this point and it's, it's it's rather poignant in my mind, and he's he simply stated, you know, there's a lot of uh, applications for which blockchain is is um, allegedly to to be the the savior, <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be the solution to all sorts of the world's problems. But he is he is quite uh, aptly stated in many times that uh, you know, it, it, t- t- frankly, a database would better solve many of the problems that are attempted to be solved by blockchain because databases are typically faster and and more efficient. Uh, and so if there's not some notable need for decentralization, databases are simply better. So as is the case for XRP Dipbot, it's something that's built on top of the XRP ledger. What's important is that the XRP ledger itself is decentralized because that ensures, you know, well, as long as you believe in cryptography, it ensures that, you know, since there's no counterparty, you can trust the transactions. All you have to trust in is, is uh, cryptography. That's that's really, it's really as simple as that. And, uh, and so then again, on top of that, that's what we'd say built the XRP tip bot on top of. And what would the purpose of a decentralization of tip bot look like? And uh, like, what would be the purpose and what would it look like, really? And I, I, I tip, there's no there's no sense to it. So in case you guys had ever wondered like that, and that's why you see a lot of developers building on top of the XRP ledger, they're pretty much all centralized. And, and that's fine. You don't need it to be. XRP, the digital asset, uh, the native asset of the XRP ledger, you know, that's what needs to be decentralized. But as far as what Ripple's doing, Ripple is a centralized company. Well, that's fine. It should be. You know, that's perfectly fine. They're they're um, they're, they're killing it out there in the world, getting all sorts of business deals with banks, financial institutions, remittance companies, and and others. And uh, that, that's there's no there would be no benefit to decentralizing it. Like, why would you need to de- decentralize individual privately owned companies? Like, I just try and make the case. I'd love to hear it because I don't think that there's any rationale out there for it. All right, next piece here. And this is, I love, I'm seriously going to have to start going to Quora more and covering this because I love reading through this. And this is the first time I've covered anything from Quora that I can recall anyway, uh, that David Schwartz wrote. And so the, the Quora, it's a website where you can ask a bunch of questions. And then uh, this is David's page, Ripple CTO, David Schwartz. And he can answer whatever he wants to answer. And uh, he's very active. And a lot of the stuff that he asks has nothing to do with Ripple or XRP or cryptocurrency, but some of it does. And this one does. Yeah, this question. So uh, he was asked, is Ripple exposed to arbitrage before the ledger closes? Is it exposed to large trade front running? And um, let me explain what what, uh, a couple of these terms in here mean before we read through this. You're not going to have the context necessary to make any sense of this. Um, And so what is arbitrage? Conceptually, it's uh, imagine buying something on uh, in one market and then selling it in another market to make a profit. Because so you're kind of looking at the spread in that particular case. So and so let's apply it to the world of cryptocurrency. Let's say, uh, just making this up, you buy Bitcoin on Coinbase, and then let's say uh, you transfer that to um, to Binance, which is a different market, and then you sell it because it's at a different rate, and then the, the difference between the two would result in a profit. And so you may have noticed this. I didn't pull up the website. I guess this probably would have been helpful if I pulled it like Live Coin Watch or something like that. But I, I don't need to, I guess, for explanatory purposes. But um, you may have noticed if you look at like Live Coin Watch or Coin Market Cap, and you take a look at the price of uh, Bitcoin, you may have noticed that the price for Bitcoin is different on every single exchange. You can go look at uh, you know Coinbase, uh, Binance, Bitrix, whatever it may be. And have you, in case you weren't aware, have you ever wondered why is the price different for Bitcoin on all of these exchanges? Well, it's because they're all their own little closed ecosystems, or maybe you want to use the term walled garden. I don't know. Maybe you do want to, <laughs> but they're little closed ecosystems, and there are different users buying and selling on each different exchange, and so there are different active participants, and those participants are reacting in real time to the buying, selling, and buying and selling pressures in, in real time on those particular closed systems, and and so that's why there are slight variances in uh, in the price from platform to platform and you might say well if they're on the, they're their own closed system how come the price is still so close well even though they're their own closed systems uh, people are not stupid and so they're aware 
of the uh, of, of the the slight differences in prices, and if it started to get too great, then people would start to, uh, to start to engage in arbitrage. And so, what would that look like again? Well, that's what that's the that's what arbitrage is. You you'd buy on an exchange, move it to another exchange where the price action is favorable to you, and then you'd sell there, and then you take a profit. And and you can actually do that. They're actually um, I can't remember the name of the company, but uh, it's become harder to do this as the the industry's developed. But there's a company out there that was having just wild gains where their entire business model was to engage in exclusively in arbitrage, and it was all automated. So it would calculate. They had algorithms to figure out what the price was on various exchanges, and then it would conduct uh, trades and it would move the cryptocurrencies from one platform to another. They're just making an absolute killing from like I can't remember. It was like I can't remember if it was like tens of thousands of percent, and then it, it got down to by the same time cryptocurrency really became to the forefront in 2018 um, they were only up like and it still sounds like a lot but like 50 percent i remember this guy whoever it was it was in some sort of interview but anyway the, the whole company it was just they're engaging in, in arbitrage that's exactly what it is anyway and so that's that and then the other term here um they asked uh is, is it exposed to large trade front running uh so what is front running you know conceptually it's not that different from insider trading um insider trading being um I think most people know what this one is, but basically it's the concept of if you have news that would affect, say, say it's a stock, you know, whatever it is, some sort of commodity, you have news that would impact the price, and then before that news becomes public, you buy or sell accordingly, whatever it would be to make sure that you financially come out ahead, and then the news, you know, passes and comes, and then the price reacts for the stock, the commodity, whatever it may be, which is illegal. You can't do that legally. Uh, so that's insider trading. Front running running is a little bit different. It's not it's not news based. It's more like if you it's if you know that a large order is going to go down at a particular date and time, it's it's logical to assume that if there's a massive influx of volume, that it would dramatically imp- impact the the price. It would make the the platform look more popular or the asset look more popular, and uh, that can draw more speculators in, which typically would drive price up. So it's not quite the same as insider insider trading, but you have knowledge of something about to happen, but it's just not general news about whatever the asset may be. It's news of an order coming through, basically. And so that, that's that's the difference between the two, and that's what front-running is. And so, again, the question here is, is Ripple exposed to arbitrage before the ledger closes? Is it exposed to large trade front-running? And then David responds here. The XRP ledger has an algorithm that unpredictably randomizes the order in which transactions execute after the consensus process. However, you can still game this system by submitting a large number of transactions and hoping that one of them will front run uh, some other transaction. Right. And so um, and then I'm going to go through. He's got four bullet points. And there's a point that I want to make before I read through these here. Uh, the the XRP ledger is super duper quick. Many most of the um, the transactions that go through on the XRP ledger are, are automated. And take a look at this. This is this is actually the XRP ledger in real time. It's pulling data from the ledger, and you can see we're on ledger. It keeps updating every three point nine seconds, roughly. That's how quickly it transacts. And this is ledger forty eight million six hundred thirty thousand nine hundred forty three. And then you can see as it's on my screen every several seconds or so, a new one's going through. And so, you know, there's a lot of buying and selling associated with this um, in terms of uh, the way XRapid works. And I know there's there's only so much of this going on because XRapid is a new technology, but that utilizes XRP. And those payment flows are actually completely automated. So the more the volume picks up, uh, the, the more activity you will see on the ledger. Now, as it pertains to, to front running here, uh, understand that there are only going to be so many massively massively massive <laughs> transactions and the majority of those although they'll appear on the ledger of course they're not going to appear to appear on um, on on exchanges if they're big enough if they're traded OTC which is over the counter those transactions those large the major transactions there's typically not enough liquidity on exchanges for those transactions to occur and that's the reason that you'll go to a company like Ripple before perhaps and uh, you do pay the market rate at Ripple unless there is some sort of strings attached to to any sort of buying agreement if it's mutually agreeable uh, with strings attached to, uh, to to selling. So there could be selling restrictions on this. The only way you're going to get a better rate that would be below market value anyway, which is that's kind of a separate topic anyway. I just thought I'd mention it. But uh, so, so anyway, if, if, even if there are, are large transactions, like I said, it's not going to appear on, on uh, exchanges. And so unless you're, watching, you're thinking that ledger activity, actual ledger activity is being monitored to agree that it would spur that kind of transaction, it probably doesn't really matter anyway. And like I said, a lot of this is just quick little buys and sells from exchanges. 
and uh, beyond that, as utility grows with uh, with XRP, and you see autom- automation uh, thanks to uh, technology built on top of the XRP ledger, such as X Rapid, you're going to see see more flowing through there. And again, that 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 would be all automated. So here's here's what David says. Let me read through his four points here real quick. And he he writes. Uh, this is not, at least by most people, including myself, considered an attack worth uh, worrying about for the following reasons. So he's talking about uh, front running. He says it's not an attack worth worrying about. And point one, there are no miners on the XRP ledger. Nobody gets to choose which transactions go in any particular ledger. You are competing on a level playing field for transaction inclusion with anyone else who chooses to participate. Uh, point two, you cannot front run in secret. All submitted transactions are public. So you will always know after the fact whether or not someone attempted to front run you. Historically, we will always know whether or not we've actually had a problem. Point three, you can only front run on the margins of the liquidity available in the system. Front running on liquid markets doesn't do very much because you have to cross the spread and consume the liquidity between the prices uh, to move the price. Point four. Only transactions that use the on-ledger decentralized exchange are even potentially affected. Pure XRP transactions are not affected in any way. And then he, he concludes by stating, That said, you should definitely make an informed decision about uh, how much this might affect you before you choose to use the on-ledger decentralized exchange functions on the, uh, on the XRP ledger. So I found that fascinating, and I thought I'd share it with you there. And uh, hopefully, if it, I, I highlighted this in one other video, but again, here's the uh, the XRP ledger functioning in real time. So in case you haven't seen that before, it's fun to just look at. Man, it's fast. Holy crap, it's fast. <laughs> Gotta love XRP, right? And here's a tweet from CZ of Binance, the Binance CEO. Biggest crypto exchange CEO says retail still driving the rally. And this is, it is in fact from Bloomberg. Cool. And this is from uh, yesterday evening. And just get into it now. And so here's the piece right here, and uh, the, the title of this piece is uh, Biggest Crypto... Oh, it was, I'm sorry, it's in the, the title is what he tweeted out. Sorry, I didn't remember that. So yeah, Biggest Crypto Exchange CEO says, Retail still driving the rally. Okay. Uh, While the arrival of institutional demand is one of the most cited reasons by cryptocurrency proponents for this year's rally, the head of the world's largest online exchange says individual investors are still playing a key role in driving the dramatic price gains. We have not seen institutions growing faster, said said uh, CZ, the chief executive of Malta-based Binance. What we've seen is pickup in both places. The number of institutions coming into the industry has not increased tremendously in 2019 yet. While both institutional and retail trading is growing at Binance, individual investors account for about 60% of trading volume, about the same percentage as last year, Zhao said. Uh, that is even as companies like Facebook Incorporated and J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. have announced major digital coin efforts, which are expected to push more companies and funds to give cryptocurrencies a closer look. And I think there's definitely a lot of truth to that. Uh, cryptocurrencies continue to come more so and more so to the forefront, and it's going to become even more impossible to avoid this uh, the realization that crypto's here to stay the more time passes. And so when you have major developments like, okay, J.P. Morgan, that was, that was a cool one, but I think even bigger than that what really got the, the most news uh, is is Facebook. Just the fact that they are in it. I, I think without that development, would we have heard the comments that we heard from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell? Would we have gotten the first ever tweet from a sitting president about uh, about Bitcoin? At least I don't think Obama tweeted about it. But uh, yeah, President Trump the other day sent out his first tweet about Bitcoin ever, and it wasn't a positive. But hey, whatever. Can you imagine? Like, who would have thought that would actually happen? And so, again, without these developments, but again, it, since it brings attention to it, and since uh, cryptocurrencies are legit and they will have staying power, all that's going to do as, as people research it more and they realize that it's not going to go away, they're going to see it as genuine opportunities. And, uh, you know, the, the first public pension fund, I can't remember the, the, uh, the woman's name that, uh, that, that was interviewed, but uh, she, was, she was talking about one of the reasons that her public pension fund did invest in cryptocurrencies with Morgan Creek Digital. And they were the first public pension fund to publicly announce that they were, uh, that were, they were investing in crypto and blockchain companies, but actual crypto assets themselves as well, not just the companies. And she, she said, uh, look, you know, it's a small percentage, of course, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's a small percentage of total investment. I don't even know if it was like half a percent of, um, of all the assets that they're managing. 
And uh, she said that it just presents quite an opportunity for asymmetrical returns, and uh, truer words have never been spoken, indeed. So I think that's fascinating. But that's just the you know the the, the first public instance where we we are you know we're aware that that has occurred. But more and more institutional in- investors are going to be coming over time. And so to me, when I look at this, the the reason I really wanted to point this article out to you is to show you we are still early. This is evidence to me we're early. It's not too late to buy a bunch of stuff. And while people are panicking today over the price of XRP and, oh my God, the volatility, this and that, and it's been too flat for too long. Uh, some people say that and some people say it's too volatile and the, the blend of the two and whatever. You're hearing all sorts of stuff. And I look at that and I say, it's not going to matter. It's kind of like being scared about Bitcoin. It's just, and we have the the, the power of hindsight now, of course. But it's like being scared about uh, if, if, say, Bitcoin were to go from ten dollars back in the day down to one dollar and freaking out. Just, just that's. Just I'm just making that up. I'm not saying it ever specifically went from ten to one, and there was a major crash at that point. I'm just saying hypothetically because there were there were um, early on crashes that at very low price points. But again, I say low back then. You could have had a ton of money into it. And then, so now you see what I don't know what Bitcoin is at today. I don't remember if it's at eleven or twelve thousand, something like that. But we were talking about back when it was ten dollars. Well, people were still freaking out. They still had real money into it, and it's the same thing today. And that's why you see people that are invested in XRP. Uh, a lot of them are, are very concerned right now. But I'm what, what I'm the, the the idea that I'm positing here is is that uh, once more money flows in, given the, how supply and demand works. The price of XRP is going to one day go through the roof if I'm correct that it has staying power, especially based on utility. This is not financial advice, but this is firmly how I feel, and that's why I'm happy to be involved. So that's just my two cents on that particular topic there. Uh, Now, this is from today's Gazette. I don't want to get too much in this because I have spoken about it a fair amount recently, but I wanted to cover just, just a little bit. And uh, this piece is titled, UK's financial regulator clears air, infers Ripple's XRP, not security token. And the piece begins, Financial Conduct Authority, FCA, the United Kingdom's financial regulator, with over 58,000 financial services firms under its regulatory watch, has said Ripple's XRP and Ethereum have similarities, pointing that the two serve as utility token and exchange token. That's part of the reason I wanted to cover this, because it's kind of fleshing out the concept of how they're being specifically viewed. Utility tokens. There is, what did I just say in the last piece? There's utility to, to XRP actually being used. And of course, it's not a security, because what would it be a security of uh, what every single company that exists? That's nonsense. So that, that's not a thing. Anyway, and the piece continues here. In a consultation paper tagged prohibiting the sale to retail clients of investment products that reference crypto assets, the regulatory body, while describing the common features of cryptocurrency and the distributed ledger technology, defines security tokens, exchange tokens, and utility tokens, pointing that Bitcoin is an example of exchange tokens that do not fall under its regulatory perimeter. FCA says some tokens, however, have mixed features, making them serve two purposes. For example, utility tokens and security tokens, or security tokens and exchange tokens, or utility tokens and exchange tokens. Adding that utility tokens can serve the uh, the purpose of e-money, uh, FCA pointed that tokens can change over time or overlap. It's good to read that. Because what, what was I saying yesterday? For anybody that watched my video about the question of is XRP security, and spoiler alert, it is not. It is not. It's not going to be deemed a security. Uh, I was talking about how conceptually they can change. And here's why. I, I'm not going to get off into it again in case you watch the video. Don't worry. But uh, uh, an, a crypto asset, a, di- a digital asset, can change over time from being a security to not being security. And a lot of that would just be a function of whether or not the, the asset in question is centralized or decentralized. And when something was created, perhaps upon inception, it was pretty centralized. And then uh, as time has passed, it has become more decentralized. And I think a good example of that is if you look at the XRP ledger, and Ripple's very proud of this, um, their hands have gotten more and more off the XRP ledger itself. And as a result, XRP over time has become more decentralized. And that's really cool. So anyway, something could change conceptually as a result of that from uh, being a security and not being a security. And that's why existing legislation uh, prior to... uh, Prior to stuff like this getting written up, uh, you know the, the older legislation, you just it didn't um, it didn't meet the needs of the, the crypto asset class. It's like trying to shoehorn a new technology 
into just existing legislation just ain't going to work so well. So anyway, it's good to see stuff like that. But uh, I like seeing this, this, this fleshed out here, and we just need to see more of this in the United States, and I think that'll help, uh, certainly help spur adoption. And again, I don't expect that uh, XRP would ever specifically be declared to not be a security, but it doesn't matter because as more uh, as more legislation comes to pass, it'll be clear which assets fall under that. So, I mean, in te- technically, yeah, they could declare XRP not a security, you know, the feds could do that. I'm not counting on it, and I don't think it matters. I, I just think eventually time's going to pass, and regulations are going to get passed, and then everything's going to be all hunky door, and we're going to move on with clarity. That's what I'm looking for. So <laughs> that's all I got for you in this video. Uh, I am not a financial advisor. Do not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Thank you for watching.